All right, welcome everyone to our latest webinar series and online course. This is all about movement disorders and how we as health and movement specialists can use this information to better uh, optimize movement patterns with our clients and with our patients. This is a four part series which is going to start by looking at the peripheral nervous system. And then we're going to transition into the central nervous system and then follow that with our connective tissue disorders and wrap it up with psychogenic movement disorders. So a four part series. Thank you for being a part of this series. Part one, we are kicking it off with peripheral nervous system movement disorders. Whew, that is a mouthful. All right, so as we kick this off, part one, we're going to be looking at, again, peripheral nervous system disorders. This, of course, means that we are going to be speaking about peripheral neuropathy, both motor and sensory, and then we're also going to be tying in autonomic neuropathy. So if you did not know that you can actually have autonomic neuropathy, we will go into exactly what that is. You do see that quite a bit with diabetic clients. So understanding that is important. And then you can also get uh, complex regional pain syndrome, which we'll be, we will be going into as well. So when we start by looking at peripheral nervous system, your nervous system is broken down into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Central nervous system, of course, is going to be your brain and your spinal cord. And then your peripheral nervous system is going to be your somatic nervous system. And, which somatic means movement, so the somatic nervous system, and then the autonomic nervous system. Most people think about autonomic nervous system as fight or flight, uh, sympathetic into parasympathetic, but I want you to also understand that your autonomic nervous system is, of course, digestion, respiration, heart rate, things like that, that of course relate to fitness and movement, but it also has to do with the way that your blood vessels, your micro blood vessels dilate and constrict. This means that it's going to have an effect on skin perfusion and it's going to have an effect on the micro circulation to your nerves, which of course feeds into peripheral neuropathic issues as well. Another big one that your autonomic nervous system controls is sweating. We're going to be going into these different conditions uh, in this part one. So nerves that could be potentially affected by neuropathy, your sensory nerves. So you could have a sensory peripheral neuropathy. If you think of diabetic neuropathy or chemo neuropathy, these are the most common types of peripheral neuropathy. Those are actually types of sensory neuropathy. You cannot feel the bottom of your feet. You cannot feel when something is hot versus cold. This is where you classically see people um, losing their balance when, they're, when they walk, or maybe they can't tell that something is hot and they could easily burn themselves. So they could step on something sharp and they don't feel it. Classic diabetic peripheral neuropathy and all of the concerns. However, I do want you to know that you can also have a motor neuropathy, which means that you start to get a denervation of the muscles, and this classically presents in the lower extremity. Obviously, that's going to affect gait. We're going to go into that. And then, as I had already mentioned, you can start to get autonomic neuropathies as well. We are going to start with the sensory neuropathies, so the different types of sens sensory neuropathy that there are. So what, what is peripheral neuropathy? What is peripheral sensory neuropathy? This is obviously going to be a damage to the peripheral nerves, extends or it affects the hands and the feet. If you're thinking of which parts of the peripheral nervous system get affected the greatest or first, it's going to be those that are the farthest away from your spinal cord. So the tips of the toes and the tips of the fingers. This will then result in, of course, numbness, weakness, and of course, pain. Pain is one of the most classic symptoms that people will associate with peripheral sensory neuropathy. Now there's different types of peripheral neuropathy. I had already mentioned that the most common ones that you will encounter are going to be diabetic and chemo related neuropathies, but there are of course other causes of sensory neuropathy. 
autoimmune conditions, you will see this uh, quite often. You will see it in different central nervous system conditions such as multiple sclerosis. So the number of people with MS who will experience sensory neuropathy is actually 25%. So if you see a lot of uh, MS clients, you can figure that one in four of those has some degree of sensory neuropathy. And then a lot of them also present with foot drop, which we will be going into as well. When you look at diabetes, there are 34 million people in the US. It's even greater globally. And I know we have a lot of people tuning in uh, globally, but I'm just going to give you the US statistics. There's 34 million people in the United States with diabetes. One in two of those people will get diabetic peripheral neuropathy at some point in their diagnosis. That means that there are, in the U.S. alone, 17 million people who have decreased sensation to the bottom of the feet. That is massive when you're thinking of the prevalence and the effects of peripheral neuropathy. Now, someone who has diabetic peripheral neuropathy has a 15 times greater fall risk compared to someone their same age with diabetes but without neuropathy which is huge as well that's one of our biggest concerns at Naboso is that we are dedicated to reducing falls and improving sensation in those with neuropathy diabetes being one of the most prevalent um, as far as other types of sensory peripheral neuropathy of course there's nutritional a lot of people when they think of um, neuropathy they'll go straight to b vitamins um, I don't have enough B12, or their primary doctor will do um, a blood test to look at their B12 levels. So it's something that is a cause, it's not the only cause, um, but just understand that you can have nutritional causes. Chemotherapy, I already mentioned that. So here's a, a statistic for you as well. So there are, every year in the US again, there are newly diagnosed cancers, 1.76 million newly diagnosed people with cancer every year in the United States. Of those who are undergoing chemotherapy, 68% to some degree will experience some degree of neuropathy. We'll go into that a little bit more, but that again is a huge number. And if you look at the number of people who will be diagnosed with cancer, it's one in four. So that is something huge that we want to understand and factor that into our understanding as movement specialists. Of course, there's idiopathic neuropathy, which is more of an autoimmune. Um, I'm actually going to go in a little bit more about idiopathic neuropathy in part four, which is psychogenic movement disorders. That means um, somatic. It's your emotional and stress states that are actually inducing these physical manifestations of your uh, state and energy that needs to be released and it's being released in a way that's affecting your movement pattern uh, and then of course goes without saying there's HIV uh, neuropathy as well now if we look at one of the most common types of peripheral neuropathy that there is diabetic is going to be the most prevalent when you look at what drives a lot of the research around peripheral neuropathy it really is diabetic now Diabetic neuropathy, classically the way that you want to think of this, if you have a client who has diabetes and you're asking them, do you have numbness in your feet? I hope that you are asking your clients who are diabetic if they have any numbness. Um, you don't want to just go straight out and say, oh, you have diabetes and say, do you have peripheral neuropathy? They might not understand that diagnosis. They might not have been diagnosed yet. Actually, a lot of diabetics, their first presenting symptom is actually peripheral neuropathy. So a lot of podiatrists are actually some of the first physicians who will actually see and then refer a patient to get further evaluated for a possible diabetes diagnosis. So make sure that you're not under underplaying kind of their understanding of neuropathy. So you want to ask them, do they have any tingling or numbness in their feet? Do they have, you know, any burning or abnormal sensations in their feet? If they do and you're suspecting that it's diabetic related, it would have to be in what's called a stocking glove pattern which means it's going to start the most distally aspect of the extremities. Typically it's in the feet, it'll be the tips of the toes. And then the other most important thing that you want to take note of is that it's going to be symmetrical. 
So if they say, ah, oh, yes, I have numbness in the, the tips of my right toes, but my left foot's totally fine. That's not going to be a diabetic neuropathy. That's where you would want to start thinking of, you know, potentially is it a radiculopathy or something that's more uh, unilateral, maybe more proximally affected. A lot of people who have persistent sciatica will start to have unilateral uh, tingling and numbness in the feet. But when you're thinking of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, you're going to make note for yourself that it is the most distal, it is symmetrical, and it is the stocking glove pattern. Now, you might be asking yourself, or hopefully you're asking yourself, what is the cause of diabetic neuropathy? The cause of diabetic neuropathy is actually different than the cause of chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy, which is different than the cause of nutritional and idiopathic. So when you're looking at diabetic peripheral neuropathy, what you want to make note of for yourself is it's going to be inflammatory related and oxidative stress related. So if you have a client who has high inflammation levels, that could even be stress, right? Someone who's very stressed out is in an inflamed state. Someone who has poor balance of their gut biome is in an inflamed state. Um, a lot of autoimmune conditions are, are inflammatory, right? So you wanna think of um, how all of this interplays and relates, okay? So it's, it's similar to aging, it's similar to a lot of other diseases, inflammation, oxidative stress. Now the oxidative stress that is classic to peripheral neuropathy or diabetic peripheral neuropathy is going to be glycation. Glycation essentially means that you are oxidizing uh, free glucose that is within the body. Now, diabetes, of course, is a classic um, uncontrolled or poor regulation of blood sugar or blood glucose, and the glucose that is freely moving within the bloodstream is then uh, accessible to this oxidation, which is glycation. Now, when you glycate uh, glucose, you form free radicals that are called AGEs, or advanced glycation end bodies or end products. AGEs, you could think of age us, right? So the more AGEs or oxidative stress in your body, or faster you age. So if you wanna live longer, younger, you wanna control your blood sugar and your oxidative stress. Yes. So now one of the largest targets of AGEs and oxidative stress is collagen. Now your collagen is everywhere within your body. And why collagen gets uh, targeted during oxidative stress is that it is a protein that has a very long half-life. So if you have something that is constantly renewing itself, it can't really accumulate the oxidative stress and the damage as other tissue that is um, uh, persisting much longer. So collagen being around much longer, it can then essentially accumulate all of these uh, micro injuries to itself. Now, the half-life of collagen is going to be one to two years for bone, and your skin has a half-life of about 10 years. So this is where you start to see wrinkles or um, kind of age spots on the hands and things like that, right? Is It's just going to be susceptible to that oxidative stress. Now, if we want to better understand how AGEs are formed, because it's important to understand diabetic peripheral neuropathy, why I emphasize this in this uh, series is that the more you understand what causes diabetic peripheral neuropathy, it helps you to educate your clients and patients on how to manage or prevent or reverse their diabetic peripheral neuropathy. So AGEs are formed by three different phases. It's a three-step process. The first phase is going to be a phase that happens within a couple hours. This is still reversible. So that reversible uh, first phase that's happening within a couple hours is important because that's one that you can actually um, interject with different supplements, which I will go into. 
Your step two or phase two is going to happen in several days. And this is something that's called an Amadori product. If you're familiar with hemoglobin A1C, which you should be because that's what's the marker of how well a diabetic is controlling their blood sugar. Yes. So it's essentially saying or gauging what is the formation of AGEs in that diabetic. Yes. So if you have a high hemoglobin A1C, that's telling you that you have a lot of AGE formation into this phase two. So the better controlled diabetic is, they will actually have a lower hemoglobin A1C, something that is below six, that you can say, ah, okay, you are controlling your blood sugar, which is reducing the rate of glycation, which is preventing the formation of AGEs. Good job, keep doing what you're doing. Now, if they have poor control, it's going to progress to phase three, which is not reversible. This is where you are forming crosslinks. Now, crosslinks, uh, if you've ever heard me speak about aging and um, how aging affects collagen and fascia and mobility and skin and joints and all of that, it has to do with these crosslinks. So if you start to get non-enzymatic crosslinks forming within your collagen, it starts to make the collagen uh, less flexible, let's say. So there are additional adhesion points within the individual collagen fibers. This then decreases the elasticity and the ability to enhance natural um, kind of rhythm and mobility within that tissue. This is where you start to see wrinkles or you see um, micro tears in the plantar fascia if we want to stay within, within the feet. You start to see thickening and degeneration of tissue. You see decreased joint mobility and stiffness. That is all related to AGEs. Now, take it one step further and collagen is not just in the skin and in the bones and in your fascia, but it's also in your blood vessels. So what's happening with peripheral neuropathy, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, is it's actually considered a microvascular disease. So microvascular disease means that the teeny tiny blood vessels that are going to the nerves have a disruption, and then that starts to, for lack of a better word, those nerves start to lose circulation and die off. Yeah, as soon as those nerves start to die off, you start to get numbness, into the tips of the toes and through the feet. Okay, so that's really what's happening from a microvascular perspective. So our goal with diabetic peripheral neuropathy is to one, control the oxidative stress. The oxidative stress is what's controlling the, the AGE formation. The AGEs start to attack the collagen, creating crosslinks, decreasing microcirculation, contributing to uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Second phase is that it's an inflammatory condition. So you want to make sure that you have a controlled inflammatory state with that client. Are they taking anti-inflammatories? Do they have a anti-inflammatory diet? Are they um, taking different supplements that favor that? Are they integrating maybe infrared saunas, um, meditating, managing their stress? I mean, all of these things are anti-inflammatory methods that we want to make sure that we're integrating from a holistic approach. If we go into our next phase, which is going to be key